Um, now, before I start, I've actually got a PDF version of this presentation which I put in my Dropbox account. So if you want to make a note of that link, and then you can go back and uh, look at all the slides again. There is a huge amount of information in these slides, um, and it does uh, all the links in the slides should work, so you should be able to click through. So I'm trying to actually direct you to lots of other sites where you can actually go on and explore the subject in much greater detail. Right, is everyone ready to move on? Okay. Um, now, um, I'm, at the moment I regard the world of autosomal DNA testing as something of a wild west. It's actually a very, very exciting time. We've got this, it's still a very new DNA test and we are re we're exploring new frontiers in genetic genealogy. And what that means is that the, we've got a sort of interesting process of trying to interpret the data, work out what it means, um, and we are still all finding our way. So there, are, there is a lot of gold out there, but there is also some fool's gold. There are lots of traps for the unwary. So I'm just going to be highlighting some of those things, but I think it, we've actually got a really nice community at the moment. We've got a lot of very active people all working together, and we're trying to just make sense of all this new data that we're getting and what it actually means. And I think if we look in five years' time, we'll be looking at it all in a very, very different way. And I just, to start with, I just wanted to take a, a look back in time because we've actually come a really, really long way in a very short space of time. When I started doing my family history research, um, the type of DNA test that we've all taken now, uh, where you can have matches with cousins, it wasn't even, it wasn't even thought of. I didn't even think such a test was possible. And it was only in 2007 that 23andMe the, one of the three companies that we use now actually launched their test and at that time it was $999 and the relative finding feature only came into being back in 2009 and then we had a period when the prices were the, the prices gradually started to come down and when Family Tree DNA launched their test it was that I paid $249 at Who Do You Think You Are Live to have my, both of my parents tested. Ancestry only entered the market in May 2012 and then when they launched their test, it was $99, but they only launched their test in America. Um, so everyone over here had to wait. And then gradually the prices started to come down, and then by 2013, Family Tree DNA reduced the price of their test to $99. Um, and then that was, when, once the price came down to that $99, that was really the tipping point when lots of people started to test. Um, and now we're at the stage where Ancestry, they only launched their test in January this year. So for people outside America, this is still something very, very new. So I think that's something we need to bear in mind. So we're still at a very early stage. So everyone who's taken one of these tests, you're, you are still a pioneer in this very new field. Um, before I go on, how many people have actually taken an autosomal DNA test in the audience here? Everyone? How many people have tested with 23andMe? How many people have tested with Ancestry DNA? And how many people have tested with Family Tree DNA? So I think Family Tree DNA are the clear winners there then at the moment. Um, so we're now at a stage where we've got three different companies offering these tests. Um, now if you're in America, you've got a very nice choice and if you pay $99, whichever company you test with, um, it's the same price. But over here it's a very different matter. Um, you have to pay 169 euros for the 23andMe test, and if you pay for the Ancestry DNA test online, you have to pay the shipping, and it works out about 161 euros. Whereas if you buy a Family Tree DNA test, a Family Finder test, it will cost you just under 100 euros. So on price alone, um, that is the main one of the main reasons why most of us are using Family Tree DNA for the bulk of our um, testing. Um, and Family Tree DNA also have the benefit of a worldwide database and um, they've got people from Russia, Poland, uh, you name it, uh, they're in the database. So regardless of where your ancestry is from, um, you should hopefully find some cousins in due course. 
Um, the composition of the databases varies, um, but I, what we normally say is that depending on what you want to, to know, there are some advantages in being all in, in all three databases because you just know where you just don't know where the all important matches are going to come from. But I would say 23M is probably the, the least favoured one for family history research because a lot of the people taking the test just aren't interested in um, in doing genealogy, so you, it's very difficult to get a response. Um, the other thing with an autosomal DNA test, it helps to test as many people as possible, from your close relatives as possible. So again, that's another reason for using family tree DNA, because you get twice as much of your money by uh, getting the tests there. And the other consideration is the, um, the tools that you get. Um, both 23andMe and Family Tree DNA, they give you a chromosome browser tool and you can actually access your raw matching segment data, um, which is very important when you want to verify that the match is as they say that it is. So well, I'll leave that up there. There is actually a very useful testing comparison chart that um, Tim Jansen has compiled, which has got lots of other details in it. Um, now, if you have tested as Ancestry DNA, one thing you can do is you can transfer your results to the Family Find database at Family Tree DNA, and that would just cost you $39, um, which is, uh, I'm not quite sure what it is in euros, something like 30, 35 euros. So that is something that's well worth doing, and if you come across someone who's tested at Ancestry DNA, do try and encourage them to transfer to the Family Find database. Um, now, I just want to do a brief recap on how autosomal DNA works. Um, we have, um, in each human cell in our body, we have 46 chromosomes, but chromosomes come in pairs. So we get one set of chromosomes from our mother and we get one set of chromosomes from our father. If you're a female, you get... Um, we, there are two chromosomes that are what are called sex chromosomes. If you're a female, you get two Xs, and if you're a male, you get an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. The important thing about the Y chromosome, it doesn't get shuffled up and recombined, but the autosomes, they do get shuffled up before they get passed on to you. So the DNA that you get from your parents is a patchwork of the DNA that you've been actually inherited from all four of your great-grandparents. And the, um, the autosomal DNA, it gets diluted over each generation. So we, we get 50% from our parents, but then from our grandparents, we only get 25% of our DNA. And it's not passed on in precise percentages. So we may get 29% from our one great, from one grandmother, but we may, may only have 20% from our grandfather. And then that effect is exaggerated over the generations. <coughs> Uh, there's, a, a, again, a, a very useful page in the ISOC wiki which has got lots and lots of details um, on the different relationships and also some data from people who've tested large numbers of family members because when you've got a match and you want to verify the relationship, you want to see if the match is within the expected range. Um, so there's a lot of data on there which you can refer to. And the other um, very important point that um, we need to remember is that our genetic tree is actually very different from our genealogical tree. Um, now, if you, in theory, you could do a genealogical tree where you could fill every single box on your family tree. I haven't been able to do that. Um, I can take some lines much further back. But with our genetic tree, we, some of our ancestors, at some point, they start to drop off our tree. Um, so it, it tends to be round about these outer circles, about five or six generations, and then that process, um, it gets, it, we lose more and more of them. So by the time you get out to ten generations, you only have a representation of about a third of your ancestors that far back in time. So what this means is if you're taking a test and you want to test a particular hypothesis, you will have much more success using these tests for the very, very close relationships. An autosomal DNA test, if you use, if it, it can, it's much more effective than a, a paternity test or a maternity test. And anything up to second cousin level, we can, it's normally straightforward to determine that there is a relationship. 
But as you go further back in time, it becomes much more difficult. But the, the, the other side of that is we do actually have many, many more fifth cousins, sixth cousins, seventh cousins, and eighth cousins. So when you do take one of these tests, what you find is you get pages and pages of matches with all these fifth and sixth and seventh and distant cousins, but it's almost impossible to find the genealogical connections with them. Um, now, Ancestry, they claim to have a, a higher success rate with more distant cousins. That's because they do something called phasing, which I'm going to just mention briefly. Um, we haven't, um, I'm not aware of anyone who's actually been able to verify their statistics to see if that actually works out in practice. Um, now, another complication is each company uses different thresholds for matches. Um, I won't go through all of that, but um, so when we're comparing the number of matches, we're not actually comparing apples with apples. Ancestry have the most relaxed criteria for a match, so um, you tend to get more matches with them anyway. Um, 23 and me have a cap on the number of matches, and you, um, they will only report the first, we think it's now the first 900 matches, and unless you've contacted the, the people that you match, the matches start to drop off your match list. Um, and I've actually lost, and in fact I was actually quite concerned, I'd actually lost a large number of my matches just over the last year, so my number of matches have, has gone down at 23 and me without me doing anything about it. Um, family, uh, family tree DNA you know, have the, the most, um, the, the, the tightest criteria, and in fact some of us will actually say that the criteria they use are incorrect, and we're trying to get them to change that, but we just have to live with what we've got at the moment. Um, so there, are, there will be cases where you may possibly have a legitimate match which is not showing up, um, and there are things that you can do to, to get round that. Uh, the, um, we did a little survey in the Genetic Genealogy Ireland Facebook group looking at the number of matches that people get. Um, and I've put my number of matches up here with the different companies. So at 23andMe, I have just over 1,000. But the range we were getting was anything from about 500 going up to just over 1,000 again. At Ancestry DNA, I've got um, well over 2,000 matches. And the, the range again there, it went from 600 to something like 4,000. The person who had over 4,000 matches, he had, he's got um, a lot of Ulster spots. Um, and we think that was probably the, the reason for that. And then at Family Tree DNA, I've got just under 500. And we, again, we had a big range there, 316 up going up to um, up well over 1,000. Um, but at the moment, at this stage, it's still very early days. A lot of us are not able to confirm most of the matches. So if, you're, if you've got this long list of matches and you've found you can't do anything with it, then you're not alone. It's just a function of it, it, being a pioneer, the early stages of the databases. I've only confirmed one third cousin at Ancestry, one fourth cousin at Family Tree DNA. Um, and a lot of the people in the Genetic Genealogy Island group said the same thing. The ones who'd made the most progress or the ones who'd spent a lot of time contacting matches, looking at trees and doing all that hard genealogy work. And it also, it, it also depends, um, I think, where you come from. Um, I, being Irish, you're at, a, you're at an advantage um, to me because you've got a lot, a lot of the people in the database are Americans, and the sort of recent emigrants to America, you're much likely to pick up as matches, whereas the, the Americans I'm matching, it's probably back in the 1600s, and I've got no chance of finding a connection when there's no surname or anything else in common. Um, okay, now some of the terminology I just wanted to um, get clear on. We talk about something called half-identical regions. Um, now, the important thing about chromosomes, as I mentioned before, we get one chromosome from our mother, one from our father. But when we look at this chromosome browser here, we're seeing the little orange bit there is a segment of DNA, and that's only on one chromosome. And the computers, I'm afraid, are not very um, proficient at the moment, and they can't tell us whether that segment is a segment that we've got from our mother or from our father. And the other complication is that sometimes the computers give us segments that are not real segments. They are false segments, false matching segments. And I just wanted to explain briefly how this happens because I think it's important. I, I think people don't realise that some of the matches that they are getting are not true matches. This is mostly, it's, it's nearly all going to be in, that, in those very distant cousins, the fifth to distant cousins. But if you were to look at your raw data, you get a string of 
you get two columns of all these A's, C's, T's and G's, but it's not sorted. So it's not sorted out so that all the A's, C's, T's and G's on the left are from your dad and all the ones on the right are the A's, C's, T's and G's are from your mum. Um, now, when you actually, you can do something called phasing, which means sorting out those columns so that you've got the ones from your mum on, on one side and the mums from your dad on the other side. So on that first row it's obvious if there are two T's you you've, must have had a T from your mum and you must have had a T from your dad. And so on the second one if you've got a G and an A, um, if your dad had two G's, two, two A's then you must have got that A from your dad and if your mum had two G's then you must have got the, the G from your mum. So computers will actually do all this work for you but it's a very complicated process and you do find some where you can't actually resolve the answer. If you're, both of your parents have got a CT, then you can't work out whether you've got the C from one or the other. Um, but the, the thing with this is, well, if you've got a long, long list of um, A's, C's, T's and G's, then um, the chances of there being any mistakes in that process, um, it, it's very, very slim. But when you've only got much smaller segments, um, it's very easy for false inferences to be made. So the computers, they, they just go zigzag backwards and forwards looking for a string of letters that match with you and match with the other person, but it could be a mishmash of letters from both sides, from both chromosomes. So essentially what I'm saying is you have to be careful of the smaller segments. Um, when we actually do this phasing process, one of our citizen scientists, John Walden, has got a cycle jet match, which I'll be talking about later, and he did a study using about 9,000 um, results. And he found when he did this phasing process and sorting out the, um, which, which chromosomes the, uh, the, the letters were on, um, as you can see from the table there, as the segments get smaller and smaller and smaller, the chances of having false positive matches um, it increases enormously. So once you get down to five centimorgans, you've got about 85% of those matches are, are false. Uh, now we do have some people who are still trying to use these small segments and trying to claim they've got um, ancestors who came from the Mayflower or whatever and they think they've got this tiny little segment and they share it with someone else and they think that must mean something so don't fall into that trap um, just it's some if you can't we will be able to use these segments when we have whole genome sequencing but we're not there at the moment so this is something to be wary of um, when you look at your matches it, you really need to focus on the larger segments and be aware that when you start going down into the much smaller segments there is a danger that you could be led astray Okay, so um, now I'm just going to run through what we do with the actual results. This is the result. I'm going to use the Family Finder um, browser and everything to, to show this. Um, now, the first thing when you get your results, the most important thing is to go to the settings at the top here. And um, has everyone entered their list of surnames on their genealogy page here? Who hasn't entered their surnames? Who's go no one's going to own up to it. <laughs> um, so that's the most important thing. I normally enter the names and also the location. And the reason for doing this is that your surnames show up in other people's match lists. And it's much more helpful if you've got a location for someone so that they can zoom in on that. Um, and if you can, do try and upload your family tree. The, the, the family tree is not that brilliant at the moment, but I understand there are supposed to be improvements in the pipeline. And then do go through all the privacy settings and make sure that everything has, is as you want it. Um, now, the other important thing um, that you can do, um, Family Tree DNA have a very nice system of projects. And all these projects are run by volunteers. A lot of the, um, the administrators are here at the conference this weekend. Um, so do join a project, because once you've joined a project, then you've got an administrator, someone who can actually help you with the results if you're lucky. And you can be put in touch with other people in the project. Um, now, not all of the surname projects will accept Family Finder results, but some do. Um, but if you've already taken a, a male, you've already taken a Y DNA test, you'll have that advantage of being in the surname project anyway. And there are lots of geographical projects. We saw that there's a very nice set uh, of the main project, and there's an island Y DNA project, but that you can still add your Family Finder results to that. Um, you will find lists of Family Finder projects and geographical projects in the ISOV wiki there. Now, one of the advantages of being in a project 
is that you can actually search for matches within a project. And that's from this menu on the left here. And this bit here where it says advanced matches. And you can also access it from the bit further down where it says tools and apps as well. Now when you go into this bit, you get this menu here. And you get a list of all the projects that you're in. And then you can actually, um, if you tick the family finder box, you can go down and select the different projects and then just search for matches in that individual project. Now I run the Devon project and now when people join the project, I always check to see how many matches they have within the project. And I, I now I'm finding that most people who join, they have at least two or three matches within the project. So that's one way of refining that vast list of matches. I and mean, at least if you match someone who's in one of the projects, then you know that it's much more worthwhile to pursue that match. Oh, that's just the box there. Um, now, the other thing, that, that this is the page that you get with your matches on, on the Family Tree DNA um, database, on the Family Tree DNA personal page. Um, now, I find it very useful. You, you can just put your surnames in the, the surname box there and search for matches by surname. But I find the mo by far the most useful thing to do is to actually download the list of matches. And that's this bit at the bottom there. And you can put all the matches in a, a nice big Excel spreadsheet if you're familiar with Excel. And then I get a nice spreadsheet like that. And then it makes it much easier. To, you can sort the matches and you can search the matches. You can add notes and you can highlight the ones that you think are worth pursuing. And you can um, perhaps uh, cut out the ones that you think are not worth the effort. So that's um, one useful thing. And the other useful thing that I find, um, oops, if I didn't mention that here, is on when you look at the, the matches here, you also get the email addresses. And I find it useful just to look at the email addresses so, so you can look for, say, people who've got the IE and the email address for other people who are in Ireland. And, um, or you, I can generally recognise the, the UK email addresses or Australian ones or New Zealand ones. So I find that's a good way of actually refining the matches. I'm looking for mostly people with English ancestry um, and it's generally Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, those are the country, and Canada, those are the countries where I'm looking to, to find the matches. Um, so the first steps, I would say, first of all, do the easy things. Look for the shared surnames that you have in common, and, and particularly the rare surnames. If you have a match and someone else has got a Smith or a Brown or a, a Sullivan, then you'll, uh, it, it, the chances are that you, you're related on different lines. But if it's a, you both have an autosomal DNA match and it's a very rare surname, the chances are that it's much more likely the match is legitimate. And the other thing is to look for the shared geographical locations of your matches. And again, that's much easier if you download the spreadsheet with all the, the matches. And it's, uh, I don't think it's worth the effort at the moment of trying to focus on those fifth to distant cousin matches because a lot of them will be false. Um, and I'm finding difficulties even finding the connections with the closer matches. So just focus on the close ones, and it is really just a matter of patience otherwise, as more and more people test and join the, the databases. And also, if you want to keep things easy, just focus on the, the, the people who've got the, the largest segments in common. So if the largest set shared segment is probably at least 10 centim organs, if not 15 centim organs. If you're from an endogamous community, do we have anyone with Jewish ancestry here? Right, okay, if you've got Jewish ancestry, you'll know the problem. You've got thousands and thousands of matches. Right, okay, that's a different subject. So you would have to focus on the longer matches, and that's much more complicated. It's probably the subject of another talk. And um, just... You, when you don't, you, uh, just ignore any matches that have got the tiny segments because it's just not worth wasting your time on those. Oh, here's the email, please. I knew I had it somewhere. Um, so the, the, these are the clues that I normally use when looking for the, the matches with... Um, and I'm trying to identify the country where someone lives. I actually wish they would put the country where people live in the, in the database, but uh, that doesn't happen. But I find this is a useful proxy a lot of the time. Um, now, if you're lucky, um, you, uh, I'm just going to run through one of the, the stories from my own um, results. Um, 
the, the surnames will actually stare out of the page at you. Um, so when you've got your surnames listed here, if the surname shows up in bold, it means that um, the, the person you match also has that surname in their family tree. So that's a, another good reason to make sure you've entered your surnames. And this is my dad's page, and I've entered the, uh, and his surname is Cruz, C-R-U-W-Y-S, and I was checking his match list one day, and then I suddenly saw this Cruz surname show up in the list in the, uh, as one of his matches there. And um, this, the, the other person that he matched, all his ancestry was in Canada, from Prince Edward Island in Canada, and there was only really one possible way that we could have been uh, related. So we went on to uh, explore that. And in fact, my dad had a, um, one of his ancestors had a brother who disappeared from our English records. And I had an inkling that this family probably had gone to Canada, but I'd not been able to prove the, the link. I managed to get a marriage record from uh, Prince Edward Island. And that was the marriage record, a very scrappy piece of paper. It, didn't need, it gave the names of the bride and groom but it didn't give any other information about the, the parents or where they were from or anything else. So we had no way of actually tying the records together. But when the match came through, the, the trees that we constructed where we thought there was a link, the um, relationship was as we expected. And um, this uh, man in Canada, he was predi he, the prediction was second to fourth cousin. And when we went back to the records, he was actually a third cousin once removed to my dad. Now, I mentioned one of the nice things to do with autosomal DNA to test lots of family members. If you can, it's a really, if, don't, if, you've got, if you can test your parents, do test your parents. Um, test an aunt, an uncle, um, first cousin, second cousin. The more people you can test, the better. Um, because it, it gives you much more confidence in the results. But it, I, I've also found it a fascinating process just to learn about the inheritance process of the DNA and you can see that here but when I compare my own results to my dad. My dad has got these three orange segments of DNA. And when it comes to me, I've only got one segment of DNA. So that just shows you how quickly these segments can drop off. And then I also went on and tested my son, one of my sons. Um, so you can see here, I tested my... I'm on the left and my son's on the right. So that segment, again, it got passed on from me to my son. Um, and if we can actually track these segments through time, we can have much more confidence in, in, that they are real segments. Um, and we're now finding that it actually helps to have this multi-generation data, um, like three or four generations. So we've got a number of people who've been doing studies, where they, and some people have even got uh, data from four generations, which is shining a lot of light on how these processes work. Um, now, Tim Jansen, one of the... Um, pioneers of our community. He's tested, um, it must be, it's well over a hundred people. Um, and one of the exciting things when you start, when you're able to uh, um, ascribe segments to particular ancestors, you can do something called chromosome mapping. And um, this is what Tim Jansen has done to great effect. And he's actually, this is actually his mother. Um, he's given me permission to use this um, slide here. Um, and he's able to identify huge segments of the genome that come from particular ancestors. So what this means is if you have a match with Tim um, and you match him on you know, a particular segment of a particular chromosome, he will be able to tell you, OK, well, we, our common ancestor must be Paul Youngman or it must be um, Harriet Lawrence. So this is the future of autosomal DNA. Um, uh, we're not there yet, but imagine in five, ten years' time, when we've all, when the database is up to ten million, we will, and chromosome mapping like this is automatic, well, we live in hope, um, um, you will almost be able to get an instant answer out of the DNA as to which segment belongs to which ancestor. At the moment, it's a lot of hard work doing this sort of thing, it's not for the faint hearted. But for the, there are a lot of citizen science, scientists out there who are trying to do this really pioneering work. Um, now, this is my rather pathetic attempt at chromosome mapping. <laughs> I've managed to map three whole segments uh, for my dad. Uh, but I'm hoping that perhaps if I come back next year, that picture will have improved greatly. Whoops. <coughs> Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to look at was the in common with menu. Um, now, in fact, I've, 
pointy here. Um, there's a little thing at the top there. Can you see where it says show simple view? You have to toggle backwards and forwards from that to get, to get this menu so that you can see the in common with matches. And this is where it's really helpful to test other relatives as well. So if I match someone, I can do the, run the in common with and I can see if they match my mum or if they match my dad. Uh, if you tested a second cousin, you can see if they match the second cousin, and then at least you know if you both match the second cousin, the match is likely to be on that particular line. So rather than having all your family tree to look at, you just narrow it down to that one small section of your tree. And what you can do with the um, in common matches, you can then add them to the chromosome browser, and then you can do something like this. This is a comparison where I've compared four people, and I've got my, um, that was my dad, and three other people. So my dad is where I match him on, every, on, on the entire chromosome because I've received one chromosome from my dad. Um, and then the other bits are where the, the, I share the, 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 these are in common with matches. And you can see two of them actually match on the same segment there and one matches on a different segment. Now, in theory, if you match, if two people match on the same segment, um, then that is a clue that they share, that you all share a common ancestor. Um, there is, of course, you've still got the possibility that they could be matching. One could be matching on a maternal chromosome, one could be matching on a maternal chromosome, um, or there's a the possibility the segment could be false. But if you've got more than one person matching on the same segment, that means you've got two different family trees to work with rather than just one family tree. So you've got much more chance of finding the surnames in common. Um, now, I mentioned false positive matches. Now, I've tested my parents, and I have 485 matches. And when I run the in common with tool, I find that I, and I, I worked out I have 198 matches in common with my dad. So, do you think it's possible to, if you only test one parent, do you think it's possible to deduce that the remaining matches are shared with the other parent? How many hands up people who think that's the case? Right, so lots of very sensible people here. <laughs> okay, so ha um, when I actually did the calculations, I found I had 166 matches in common with my mum. But that means that 28% of my matches are not shared by either of my parents. Um, so what that means is some of those matches are going to be false positives, but also some of them may be false negatives. They may just be falling under that match threshold at family tree DNA, um, which is a rather artificial threshold, um, and that's something we, we, where we have to do other things to try and investigate that. Um, uh, what I found is all these um, ones that don't match my mum and my, or my dad, it's all those fifth to distant cousins, which is why I don't think, when you've got 28% um, of those that are likely to be false, I just don't think it's worth the effort of um, trying to investigate those, unless you've got a shared surname in common. Um, now, the other thing you can do, if you want to, again, this is probably more for advanced users, you can download the matching segment data. And you do this from the chromosome browser. And there is a little bit at the top there where it says download all matches in Excel format. Um, and this is rather a simplified version of uh, the uh, um, spreadsheet. And once you've downloaded the segment data, you can sort it by chromosome, you can sort it by centimorgan size. Um, make sure do, you don't want to download all the tiny little segments under five centimorgans. Just make sure you, 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 you get rid of those from your spreadsheet. Um, and then you can, you, what you will find is you do end up with lots of segments that are overlapping. Um, and you can, if you've tested one parent or another, as in this case here, I can assign a P where they match my father, or you can assign an M where they match your mother. So this is what people do if they want to do chromosome mapping. I'm not going to go into all the details of doing that at the moment. There's a page in the ISOG wiki. It's not something you have to do, but some people do get a lot of pleasure out of doing this. Um, okay, now... Um, one of the things I mentioned, we do, what we have noticed is that you do get a lot of these overlapping segments all on the, the same, same part of the same chromosome. Now, Ancestry have done some very interesting um, simulations, and what they found was that um, if you have three fourth cousins, 
the chances that three fourth cousins would all match on the, the exact same segment are actually 0%. Now that's very different from the data that we're seeing when we're looking at the matching process and quite often we're seeing lots and lots of people matching on the same segment. So there's obviously something very funny going on here um, and the reason is something called pedigree collapse. And this is something that affects people at different times in their pedigrees. Um, now I have to go back to about the 1600s before I find somewhere in my family tree, two first cousins marrying each other. Um, but um, in a lot of Irish communities, the rural Irish communities, that pedigree collapse is going to hit you a lot earlier. Um, also, a, a lot of Americans um, have a very um, endogamous ancestry in that period between about 1600 and 1800. Um, so Ancestry, when they looked at their, um, they got a DNA circles feature, they found that um, the matches going back four generations, the number of matches that people were getting was as expected, but then as you go back more and more generations, when you go back seven generations, people were getting far, far more matches than um, we might expect. And the reason for that is once you get back to that point of pedigree collapse, when you match someone, you could actually be related on multiple different lines. And that makes it much, much more difficult. It may be you match on a segment, and it may be you've got, you share a family tree with someone, but the person you've identified in your family tree may not be the person from whom you've inherited the DNA. So that be process becomes much more difficult the further you go back in time. Ideally, everyone would have researched their family tree and filled out every single box and will know every single ancestor going back for five generations and then you would hope that everyone you match has done the same, but that rarely happens. How many people here have managed to identify all 64 great, great, great grandparents? Anyone? How many, one, how, how many people have identified all 32 great-great-great-grandparents? Right, so that's pretty impressive. And how many have identified all 16 great-greats? Okay, so you can see how difficult it is to start drawing false conclusions. Um, if you suddenly leap on the first name that uh, um, jumps out of the family tree at you. Um, now, the other problem that we notice is that on certain regions of the chromosome, people have inordinately large numbers of matches. I've actually used, um, this is from Donworth's Autosomal DNA Segment Analyzer, which gives a nice visual representation. And uh, this is one of my chromosomes, and all those block, those big rectangles, that's all one chromosome where all these people match me. Um, and I've seen some of these charts where the, the actual um, the, where the, 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 the actual segment is absolutely huge, and people have got some people have got hundreds of people all matching on the same segment. So there's something very strange going on there. We don't actually know what the answer is at the moment. It may just be this common shared heritage, and you know, all people who have colonial American ancestry, they all have to share so many common ancestors that they just pass on that same segment. It may be something to do with the fact that we're only we're using chip data, we're not using whole genome sequencing, and perhaps when we do sequence the whole genome, we'll, we'll get different matches. Um, but this is something to be wary of. I have a theory that the more people you match, the less likely you're going to be able to find, you're going to be able to use um, that segment. But um, it's still very early days at the moment. So um, there is this process um, of triangulation. Some people are trying to triangulate on segments. Um, but I think it's actually a dangerous practice to try and triangulate. If you, if you match a, a fifth cousin and you've got other fifth cousins who all, who all match on one segment, um, I think it's, you can't start drawing conclusions in the absence of any other data. You have to triangulate from the known to the unknown. And triangulating from the known means triangulating from known relatives. So if you've got a match and you match with your father or your mother or you match with your son or your daughter and you share the match with a cousin and then you also match someone else you can uh, who's say a fifth cousin you can be much more confident that that is a real match some people will try and tell you that if you have a match and the segments triangulate regardless of the size of the segment then that means that it's a real segment but no one is actually trying to test that hypothesis 
Um, and um, my theory is that if you the triangulated segments are subjected to the same laws of inheritance as any other segment, and the smaller that they get, the more likely they they are to be false. But you will see some people trying to put forward this um, claim that triangulated triangulated segments are going to be real segments. I'm being perhaps a bit controversial saying that, but we've had a, um, I think this is one of the things about being in a pioneering field um, where we are still feeling our way. And the other takeaway point is that when you have a match, the identified paper trail ancestor is not necessarily the one who has contributed the segment, so be prepared to sometimes change your conclusions. But what I do think we may see is that some of these triangulated groups may actually provide clues to common origins. Most of my triangulated groups, they all seem to be matches with Americans, but I've got one little triangulated group that happens to include a few Gleasons in it as well, which I think is an Irish one. And beware of the small segments under 5CM. So do be prepared to modify your conclusions in the light of new evidence. Now, to close, I just wanted to quickly run through the... Um, origins reports. Um, these I would just regard as entertainment value, don't take them too seriously. I've just put my results up here. I get different results from all three companies, 56%, 57% are British and Irish from 23andMe, Ancestry only think I'm 21% British and they think I'm 20% Irish. I've only got one Irish great-great-great-grandmother. Um, but what we, one of the tools that you can use is GEDmatch, and they, um, if you are interested in doing these admixture analyses, they've got all sorts of tools on there where you can compare yourselves with ancient DNA samples and po populations from all over the world. But the other advantage of using GEDmatch is if, if you can actually compare results of people who've tested with other companies. Um, I've not been able to get any update on how many users they have. And th this is from about a year ago, but I, it must be several hundred thousand by now, I'd imagine. Um, so if you meet someone who's tested at, say, 23andMe, and you've tested at Family Tree DNA, if you both upload your results to GEDmatch, then you can do comparisons there. And if you've got a match with someone and you think that it's not showing up at one of the other testing companies, again, you can do the comparison at GEDmatch, and it may just be, if it's something like a third cousin, um, it may just be that it's just a victim of the, the match thresholds and you can do the, the, the check on here. And there's all sorts of extra tools that they provide. You can um, look at your eye colour and there's also another tier where you pay a subscription for all sorts of extra features. Um, I won't go into all the details of that now. Um, and these are all the different um, admixture tools. I, I still regard these as entertainment value, but some people seem to like, really like playing with all these things and just seeing what percentages uh, they get from them. And that's my Eurogenes K12, if that means anything to anyone. It doesn't mean anything to me, but it just gives me a very nice, pretty <coughs> pie chart there. Um, now, there are a whole range of tools that you can use to use with your data. If you go to the ISOG wiki, there's a list in there. The one that I really like is the Donworth Autosomal DNA Segment Analyzer that I showed earlier. And there are all sorts of other nice tools that you can use on that DNA GEDCOM website. There's another one called a Genome Mate that uh, some people use. If you want to get into the chromosome mapping, that, does a, that automates a lot of that process for you. This is just, um, just to remind you of the, the um, ADSA segment analyzer. And the nice thing about this is you can actually click through on your matches from the, the segment tool and you can email them and do, you can actually see all the details on the here. So really, and this is all done for free by one of our citizen scientists. We've got some just absolutely amazing tools out there. And some, a lot of these tools are produced by the adoption community in America. We've got a lot of adoptees desperate to find their roots. And these tools actually came off the back of that where they're trying to get every single Single ounce, ounce of information out of the data. And I even had to, this is another exciting thing about this field at the moment. There are new things happening all the time. I had to update my presentation this week because a new tool has just come out, and this is actually from the academic community, um, something called DNA Land. And you can upload your data here. It's a couple of scientists from the New York Genome Center. And they are even doing the relative matching. But the idea is that you can put your data onto DNA land, and then the scientists can actually use your data, and you can also get something out of it as well. And I haven't even had a chance to put my own data on here, but one thing I was intrigued to see was that with the segments, they subdivide them into recent segments and also ancient segments using different algorithms. 
So that's just another interesting new innovation that we have. So we just we're, we're just bewildered with data at the moment and tools to use. You, you could spend hours, you could spend all day, every day playing with your autosomal DNA data if you wanted to. Um, we have a very um, active community. These are the, the key sites that you need to go to to explore. Um, you'll be able to click on those from the PDF. Um, so just to sum up, um, with autosomal DNA, some people have instant success when they take a DNA test. We do have some people who find matches with first cousins, even with siblings and half-siblings and parents in the database when they first test. But for most of us, it's really more a question of patience and waiting for the database to build so that we get more of those cousins that we want who can help us with our family tree research. There is a very active community out there. Do participate in our community. community. Do join the mailing lists and the Facebook groups. Um, and do um, contact the volunteer project administrators who can help you. We're all learning together in this process. And we, things will keep changing as we go along. But it really is a lot of fun to be one of the pioneers and to be in at the start of this really exciting period in genealogy. Okay, so, any questions? Thanks very much, David. That was fabulous. Uh, we have questions from the audience. Yes, we have a question down here from Albert. Great talk. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but DNA Adoptions has made classes on how to... Uh, okay, I, my father was adopted. Right. And me and my half-brothers, you know, were able to kind of sort of phase our matches and which one from the young one to my grandfather. Yeah. Um, and they, they have a class on the methodology. Yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah, so they watch us 35 hours, and they're going to have an advanced school coming up, too, and you can register. It's a lot of information, and it, 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 it really is very helpful though, if you're trying to construct the tree that goes back to your adopted grandfather and mother or whatever. Yes, a lot of it is actually doing the genealogy research, and it's. Uh, I, mean, I, I know we've got these search angels out there who are spending hours and hours and weeks and weeks just pouring through genealogy trees, conduct, uh, uh, constructing trees, and just trying to find bits where it's like a process of tree triangulation, trying to find bits of trees that triangulate. Um, so a lot of autosomal DNA, it's actually doing the genealogy research rather than the DNA. The DNA provides the clues and then you have to follow up with the genealogy research. And last year I was talking to the DNA adoption group and they reckon they reunite about 125 adoptees each year. Currently, last year, 125 adoptees with their birth family. So that would be half siblings reuniting after this time. I had a 75 old lady contact me in January. Uh, by March, she was reconnected with her siblings. She found four of them. Yeah, I was just going on to that point about um, people that contact you and they have no information because they are adopted. Um, how would you approach uh, such a person if they contacted you as a match, as a, as a say, a court cousin match? Um, right, well, I, I norm, well I've, I've got my family tree on there, so I just say that they can look at my family tree. The, the problem I've had is the people who contact me, they, they've got the, they're adopted and they're in America, and I don't have any recent relatives from America, so I don't think, I mean, I'm happy to help if I can, but I just don't think my results can help them. If it's a close match, it's, it's a different matter, but if it's a fourth cousin match, then there's not really much that you can do other than just sort of wish them well and say that, you know, you're happy to help if there's anything you can, you can do. Um, I mean, with with the adoptees, they're really what they're really hoping for. Are the like sort of if they can get a first or second cousin match, or possibly even a third cousin match, then they can work the trees forward. But it's much more difficult when it's fourth cousins, and then they're trying to look for patterns in in the trees. Yeah, there was just one person that contacted me, and uh, she was the thought, or her father was the highest up match to my father. Right. And she had a couple of names. And I was trying to figure out, like, what should I, should I be um, circumspect with what I would re reply? Because, of course, the, the ancestor could be somebody else. 
Well, it could be, but I, in that situation, any information that you can give her is helpful and it's a clue. She may not be able to use it or it may come in handy when she has matches with someone else. And for, for these adoptees, we had a really moving talk here last year um, from Rob Walton, um, where he was looking at his wife's um, ancestry and she was adopted. And just having that connection with... I mean, she, she was in America and just having that connection with someone in Ireland, um, she just found that just so meaningful and she actually came along and met the person in Ireland he was actually in the presentation so I mean um, just do what you can um, and what you feel happy with um. and refer them to the DNA adoption group Yes. Uh, a lot of adoptees may not actually know that there is a group out there for them uh, there's also a Facebook group uh, that they can get proper advice and information from and like Barbara was saying they do run classes where they can teach adoptees how to use their particular methodology because really an adoptee is going in blind and they've got very little information from their own family tree. So what they're hoping for is that they're going to have several matches in a small triangulated group who might be able to figure out that particular group's common ancestor, which hopefully will be the adoptee's common ancestor as well. Uh, so they're, hope, they're really relying to use other people's work as a proxy to find their own common ancestry. Yeah, the, the, pay, the, uh, the, the Facebook group they need to go to, it's a group called DNA Detectives, um, and that's a very active group where a lot of the search angels are, and they, they will actually help with doing the research, doing the genealogy research. And there is also a page in the ISOP wiki, if you just type adoption into the wiki, where you'll find all the mailing lists and things that will help them. I've had siblings take the one of them and um, I expected each of them individually had, I don't, let's say over 100, 150 each. But when I put the two together just for fun, they really only matched maybe about five or seven people. Why would that be? And they were all like fifth cousins. So if they're siblings, shouldn't all the people match up? No, no, not at all, because you only get half... You, as a, um, you only get half your DNA from your mum and half from your dad and your sibling will get a completely different representation of the DNA from your parents to you. Um, so you wouldn't expect to have all the same matches. You'd probably expect to have most of the closer matches but certainly when you get out to that um, fourth and fifth cousin level you, you'll probably end up with quite a big range of different matches. That's, a, that's what you would expect. Unless you were twins, you would have identical matches. Question from Sean. Not really a question, more a statement on the adoption thing. Uh, Debbie uh, made a very interesting point, a very important point about geography. And if you mention in your details of your ancestors the geography, Maybe it gives a, a signpost. I recently found out the larger generation of my 84 year old mother's natural father and by coincidence the lady who was able to match me on autism in the same family history organisation as myself. So that's another point is about networking within organisations in the local environment, the local geographical place of interest. So that was a very interesting point about geography. I think we need to highlight that more geographical signposts and points as a very important sections to fill out. I don't think I've got the full menu here, but the surnames are for autosomal DNA, and then for the Y DNA, you can you have to fill in the most distant known ancestor on that paternal line. So that's just on the surname line. So um, you might put in, I don't know, um, John Sullivan born 1808 County Kerry or something. Um, but in fact, with that menu, you can use the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA in combination with the autosomal DNA, and that can sometimes help to rule out rule matches out or in. Yeah, 
Um, well, that doesn't show up on the auto. That doesn't show up on the autosomal DNA results. It's only the surnames that show up on that. If you've done a mitochondrial DNA test, um, you can put in your most distant ans known ancestor with that. But again, that won't show up on here. Um, but it's best to do put the family tree up if you can and upload a GEDCOM. Um, I don't know if there's a, well, there's a, the, there are the big genealogical societies. I don't know if there's a local Dublin family history society. Um, Gerard Corcoran is the ISOB representative for Ireland, and he's probably the best person to ask for local organisations within Ireland. Um, oh, Ger this is Gerard here, right, okay, sorry, yes. Yes, uh, the stand right next door to us here is GSI, Genealogical Society of Ireland, and they, they, they're also the group that is behind the Irish DNA atlas. But it raises a very interesting question, should we have a special interest group devoted to genetic genealogy in various places all around Ireland? And uh, that's, I think, something that would be of interest to a lot of people. Uh, we're not quite there yet with the organisation because we're still quite a young uh, organisation, we're still all volunteers, we're all mm -hmm. low of day jobs, but um, uh, certainly in the US where they're a little bit more advanced in terms of genetic genealogy, there are special interest groups popping up all over the place. So I think it would be a very feasible thing, especially with Epic Ireland coming on board next year, maybe to have regular workshops in uh, Epic Ireland for, for the Dublin area, and maybe also have regional centres as well, or say Clare, Clare Heritage Centre, you know, the various um, emigrant and heritage centres around the country. It would be useful to have people like yourself who are starting out and then able to maybe communicate your confusion and also the things that you learn to other people who might be interested. So it's very, very much a kind of a grassroots movement that we'll have to try and get going here in Ireland. Debbie, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, Debbie, thank you.